Christian Bruni. up to share. I uh, always cringe because I think, man, I need to get saved every time he talks. We were, we were at the uh, prison function a few while, a, a little while back, and we had to kind of trick Pastor to go, and I justified the deception had him come under other pretenses when he was being awarded like the 60-year award for being in the prisons and in the jails or however long it was. And everybody there pretty much loved God and was serving God, the chaplains, the people. And, of course, when Pastor Wall gets up, he starts to do an altar call and challenges us all to be saved. So, I mean, these wardens and all these people, he's challenging them to be saved right there. And this, this is just, it's who he is. And just like right now, you know, I'm sitting there checking myself. Like, man, I need to get, what do I need to get straight here? Because we're going to bear fruit. We need to get some stuff straight, right? How many, how many would say I still need, you know, I want to go to heaven, but not tonight. I still need to get some things straight. You know what I mean? Some, to go to heaven, Bishop. Right now? No, we, we need to get some stuff straight. You know, we, we still want to drive some cars and have some houses and do some things. Amen. I want to go to heaven too, but not tonight. I still want to serve the Lord and see my sons and daughters do exploits and see got people saved and set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, it says, and you don't have to turn there, but it talks about Jesus cleansing the temple. And it says, in Matthew 21, then Jesus went into the temple of God and he drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. I long for the day when there's remnant churches all over America and Phoenix and like here, where when you go in, the first thing you don't see is a bookstore where they're trying to sell you a book other than the Bible. Come on. Or they're trying to get you to uh, exchange something for money. Uh, we had letters come in from all over the world, and one just came in from Texas, another one just came in from Mississippi. But Pastor Walt, in 21 years, and I'm just giving God the glory, but I, I got saved 30 years ago last month. I've been in the ministry 25 years. I really was in the ministry from the beginning. I didn't know it, but I was in the ministry from day one. I just didn't know it. But officially in 25 years ago, it was ordained almost 22 years ago. But in that time, I realized, you know, Pastor Walt, never once have we had to sell a tape, sell a book, sell anything. We've not even charged people for shipping. Over 35,000 people are going through our maintenance man across the world. And none of them ever had to have purchased one. And philosophically, the labor is worth his wages. I understand some people need to charge, and I'm not here to say against that. I'm here to give God the glory and say, we've never had to sell nothing. So when Jesus comes back to cleanse the temple, he don't have to cleanse that part. Of it. And I want you to pray, and Pastor Walt to pray, I want you to pray. Ten years ago, my brother got mercy in his leg, and he was in ICU, they thought he was going to die, and people prayed all over this valley, and he made it out. And then ten years to the day, almost, to this month, uh, last night with 103 degree fever, he went back in with MRSA, where they're going to have to cut all this stuff out of his legs again. It's some brutal virus. I don't know exactly how it works, but it's, if you ever get it, you'll know because most people die from it. But it's it's a real bad disease in the in the tissue, and uh, he's got it back again. So if you can keep his name's Mitchell, if you'll keep him in prayer and keep my mom in prayer, there's nothing. Uh, a mom is a warrior, and uh, they. Pastor Walt called me a warrior, and a lot of times I feel like a warrior, not a warrior, a warrior. But um, we, we, my mom is a warrior, and uh, pray for her, and pray for, for my brother, if you would, and pray for me. I just uh, have gone through just some chronic things with my neck and the center of my back, and you know, I, I mean, the devil's a liar. Amen. My, my, my son Joshua and my son Jordan were both ordained last month. And uh, the minute they were ordained, all of a sudden, here come the attacks, and here come supernatural things, the prince of the power of the air, moving things around to try to distract and try to get us off course. Because I love my brother, but if my brother goes to be with the Lord tonight, I'll still have been here, I'll still be at my post this week, and I'll see him in heaven. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm going to celebrate. I'm not going to get, get it twisted. It's appointed to die once, and then the judgment, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. And... Uh, I want to be about my father's business. And those 
doing the will of who's my mother, father, brother, sister? Who is it? It's those doing the will of my father in heaven. And uh, this misfits, all of you misfits, this misfit, and all you misfits were brothers and sisters. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And Jesus, I read in Hebrews 2, I didn't understand it when I read it, but he said that Jesus was not ashamed to call us brethren. I thought, well, man, I'm ashamed of myself a lot. Sometimes I'm ashamed of other people. Sometimes people, I'm sure, are ashamed of me. But Jesus, the perfect one, is not ashamed to call me his brother. And then in Hebrews 11, it says, he's not even ashamed to be called our God. So Romans 1, 16 and 17, so I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. For faith to faith is written, the just shall live by faith. God is doing so much. People, you visited in jail today. A girl got up and testified. Two years and three months, she's been free from heroin. People in jails right now, they've started. Yes, I mean, I'm sure heroin's addictive. You know, as, as, a, as a white supremacist, we always did cocaine. We didn't do the lower things. We stayed on the higher drugs. <laughs> How many of you know it's, drug's a drug, right? And it's, it's going to take you down one way or the other. But she's been clean for two years and three months, and I think that's awesome. And just people are being touched all over. And praise reports were coming in just stacks of them, Pastor. Well, we couldn't get through them fast enough. We had a whole two-hour service just praising and thanking God and public testimony of what God is doing. And he's doing it everywhere. You know, you can look at the, you can look at the news reports and the media and the f fake news, and you can believe all that garbage if you want to, and Dr. Filthy and Okra Wing Freak. But I'm telling you... The, Whose report will we believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. I don't care what the newspaper says. I care what this paper says. What God says. I don't want to be on Facebook. I want to have my face in this book. I want to be faced in this book. Because, because this is going to tell me the truth about who God is. And God's going to tell me the truth about who I am and who you are. Because uh, man's, man's papers are going to lie on and they're going to get it twisted, so be careful. So I know, Pastor Walt, you'll pray. And I want to thank you too, Pastor Walt, for this Friday. Uh, my son, Jordan, uh, Athletes International Ministry, gave him the International Athletes International Ministry High School uh, Athlete of the Year Award with 10 other recipients. And Pastor Walt's bringing 75 to 100 of you to come and just support that. Half the recipients, there's 10 of them, half of them aren't saved, half of them are. So it's, an, it's going to be an evangelistic outreach. We're having a four-day conference with athletes coming from all over, two or three hundred of them for four days, probably about two or three thousand coming this Friday night. And I'm just thankful, uh, Pastor Walt, for you to rally around that and, and come. And same with the D4 conferences. Me and Pastor Walt have been working together for so long, I can't even remember how many years it's been. It's just the hand in glove. We've been working together. And it's not some relationship where we have to email or text. I don't even know how that works. And I don't even think Walt even knows what a computer is. I don't either. But, and even if we did, we wouldn't ask each other what color shirt we're wearing. We're just not that kind of, we're just not that kind of crew. You know what I mean? We don't, we're just going to do the work of the Lord, the will of the Lord, and just unite and just do it together and help each other without any catches or phrases or cliches or or I know Pastor Walt's turned down being on the cover of Charisma magazine probably ten times. I've only turned it down once or twice, but I don't got nothing to say to him. Do you, Pastor Walt? I don't know what I would say on Charisma magazine. I don't know what that means. But uh, I know God is good, and His grace is good. And I uh, today I have uh, I share a spiritual son. Uh, Van, he was ordained last month also. So. We're going to expect more out of him tonight now that he's ordained. Because last time he preached here, he wasn't ordained. So now we're, we're believing God for that double portion. And uh, he's a spiritual son. I shared that. Uh, Anthony Reed is here with us tonight. Anthony, just wave your hand. I ain't going to tell you what kind of business he's in because I don't want you looking him up trying to get stuff from him. But he's a successful businessman. If he wants to share it with you, you can. I mean, you can hit him up. But anyway, he, uh, he, him and I share in the, the duties of raising our spiritual son, Ellis Mitchell, Minister Mitchell, who wants to come and he's going to share the word of God. He goes way back with church on the street back in the day. Didn't you used to rob them when they would come and do stuff? Or <laughs> threw fireworks at the church on the street workers, scattered him, and then went and took all the hot dogs. So he's a monster, right? Let's give Minister Mitchell a round of applause. Hey. Jesus! Jesus! Yeah. 
Down. I don't think you believe it. We serve a God that's alive and well. We serve a God that's alive and well. The enemy is defeated. He's crushed under the feet of King Jesus. And we bear the blood of King Jesus. And so the enemy is crushed under our feet. What a privilege it is. Father, be seated, guys. Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. And I thank you for this place. I thank you for this place, Lord. A place where... Men and women can come together, Lord God, and they, they know who they are. They know the struggles of this life that we share, the common struggles that we share, Lord. And we all know that we're in need, in desperate need of a Savior, Lord. And you are Savior. You're the only one that can save to the uttermost, Lord, beyond bottomless, Lord God, where no one else could reach. Jesus, your arms are not shortened by our situation. And so we just thank you for the privilege to be in your presence. And I just ask, Lord, you're already here. I just ask that you just clothe yourself with me like you used Gideon, Lord, and just do your thing. Um, I'm, just do your thing, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I, had, uh, I had no idea where I was going to start tonight. Kind of knew where I wanted to end up. But you know what? I, I think what I want to do is remind us of the victory that we have in King Jesus. Now, understand, you know, because I, I, I have a brother who used to be a, uh, I mean, he used to be strong, I thought, in the Lord. And, and he was, my brother's 20 years older than me, and I used to look to him for, for guidance. And um, he got himself twisted up in some, some other things, some other doctrine, some foreign doctrine. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just crazy it's crazy what can happen when we forego the simplicity of the gospel message. The simplicity of the, the blood, the atonement, the blood, and the cross of Jesus Christ. It's, you can get yourself out there and lost. So it's important that we stick to the scriptures. Yes, we overcame him, the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Okay? But it's important that we stick to the scriptures because we can get ourselves lost. I don't know who that was for. Maybe somebody got somebody that's struggling in something or what, but stick to the basics. It's, it's power in that. Amen. It's power in that. But I want us to go, if you guys got your Bibles, let's open up to 2 Samuel chapter 23. And, you know, my, I guess I'm, I mean, I'm still kind of young, I guess, and as far as preaching and stuff, so I'm still developing a style and learning how to trust God and not over, you know, overreach and do things, but I like to tell stories because my spiritual father likes to tell stories when he preaches and give testimony along the way and just show how the, the scriptures are, um, how we can apply them to our everyday lives even now. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, it's not something that's so far away. It's not something that's so uh, mysterious that you can't relate to. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's easy to, to look back at all these men and women of God and see all the exploits that they did. And like, man, that was, that was dope for them back then. But that don't really relate to me and my, my struggles. You know, they don't, the, the Bible don't really talk about the dope that I was a, addicted to. It don't really talk about, you know, the, the women that I was addicted to. Well, if you pay close attention, spiritually speaking, you'll see that it relates to us right here today. The, the scriptures are, like, like the word of God says, they're, they're living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Pierces even to the division of soul, spirit, joints, and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. There's no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. These words are living and they're powerful. But 2 Samuel chapter 23 is where I wanted to start because this is King David here. And we can relate to King David quite a bit because as Bishop says every time he's here, that David was a man after God's own heart. Okay? But in knowing that, know that David was also a wild man. He was a, he was a sinner. He was a contract killer. He was an adulterer. He was all these crazy things. Yet and still, he was a man after God's own heart. And I was having a conversation with my spiritual father the other day. 
And he was telling me, as you look through the scriptures and you see these 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 stories and these things that people go through, most of the most of the holy writ were, were meant for us to see. You know, you, you read Ezra and Nehemiah and they talk about the captives coming back and rebuilding this wall and rebuilding the temple and, and God bringing revival to the church. It was important that we saw that and they wrote those manuscripts so we could see and relate and say, oh, revival is coming. It's time for men to gird up swords. The word of God It's time for men to stand their post. Right. And women of God to be alongside them and to rebuild the walls and to stand up and know that Christ is coming. But in the meantime, there's work to do. It was important that we read those manuscripts, and that's what they were for. But it was something about King David where you really look at his words, and it's like, man, how did we get a hold of this? Because David is writing about things in a secret place where it's just him along with God. And so as we read the, the, the privilege of reading King David's writings, understand it. David wasn't writing necessarily for a big audience to be reading and like, oh, that was tight. No, David was alone with his God. David was going through everyday struggles like we go through everyday struggles. And David was like, he'll find himself in a corner where all his men were around him. And even his own men wanted to stone him because their, their wives and their children got taken captive. And all their food and everything got took plunder. And David's by himself. And the scripture says that David relied on the Lord his God. And so when David found himself in that place surrounded by his enemies on all sides, David said, Lord, how they have increased to trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. He said, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. David said, I lay down, I slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, David says. Save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. These are words, beautiful words, that we have no business having a hold of, but we got them. And when you find yourself in that deep, dark place where you're surrounded all around, you can remember, wait a minute. King David went through similar struggles. King David was a sinner like I'm a sinner. Yet still he was a man after God's own heart because he relied on the Lord his God. Do you get what I'm saying? We don't got to stay in that murky water. We can rise up. But I got us at 2 Samuel. As soon as I find it, I'll be thankful for that. But this is King David now at the end of his life. And King David came to an understanding. Because, like I said, he had all these exploits, all these things that he endured, and all the beautiful writings to the Lord his God. But David came to this place, and this is literally in my Bible, it says, David's last words. It says, now these are the last words of David. Thus says David, son of Jesse. Thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. David says, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be like the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, like the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after the rain. In verse 5, David says, although my house is not so with God. Now, as Bishop said before he left, I'm recently ordained. And, you know, if I'm being 100 percent honest with you guys, I was excited about it. It was something that I prayed for, something that I longed for. My wife could tell you, my spiritual father and my family could tell you it's something that I longed for. But when it came, it was different than I expected. <laughs> Pastor Walton, any other pastors or men of God in this place, any ministers can tell you that. The weight of carrying that thing can be heavy. Amen. Dude, when I, when a true story, when I woke up in the morning afterwards, I woke up and the only thing I could do was just, <laughs> I mean, I cried like one of those snotty, nasty, ugly cries. And I just laid on the ground and I could feel my wife moving around me, got up and she's like trying to figure out what to do with this grown, heavy man that's crying. And all she could do was like, 
<laughs> turn on some worship music like, God, you do and you do your thing. And, and that's what it takes sometimes. But, you know, we're called to press on and endure. And I think what I want to encourage you by by going to this is understand that if you are under the sound of my voice, that God isn't calling you to stay where you are. You, you, you get what I'm saying now? Now, don't get it twisted. If you in phase one, I ain't saying, no, nah, dude told me to bum rush and get up out of here. No, no, no. Stick to the process. There's a process to this thing. But understand, don't get complacent where you are. You hear me? Don't get complacent where you are. Now, everything I have, I receive. So when you hear me refer to something that my spiritual father said, I'm sure that makes him proud because I'm learning little by little. But he taught me something else. He said, you know what? If you take a man who's been at his job for 30 years and you take a man who's been at his job for one year and the man who's been there for 30 years refusing to to learn and to grow but you know he has seniority so they're upping his pay every year but he's still all he's really doing is just repeating year one for 30 years but you got this this young dude that's been there for a year and he's eager to learn he's excited to grab hold of whatever this job has for him so he can excel at it see sometimes in the ministry it's easy to become complacent and you get to a place where you know what i've been in this thing for a while god owes me something you know what pastor wall owes me something bishop moody owes me something mr reed owes me something no that is a lie from Satan. You hear what I'm saying? He would love to get us to a place where we just stay complacent and we there ain't no room to grow like that. But when you can, see, that's the beauty about having a real relationship with God. Because when you get in that secret place along with him, he'll, he'll knock. He's knocking. And if you will answer that door and say, you know what, God, I know I've just been doing my own thing for a long time now. Just... You know, rhythm and road, just doing it. But God, I know that you have more for me. And I'm not going to overreach to get it. I'm not going to let my growth be stunted and stay in this place. But you know what? Give me that balance, Lord. And help me to walk this thing out according to your will, according to your way. And he's faithful and just to do it. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we serve. And King David came to the to the realization that he's done all these beautiful things in his life in his life. He's done all these crazy things in his life. But when he took account, he realized that, you know, all these attributes that a real true man of God should have, he fell short. So that should give us, you know, just a it should give us a fight to know, like, man, I got a chance at this thing. If I just hold fast and trust whatever it is that my God wants to do in my life, being sim- simply being obedient, huh, wife? Simple obedience will get us to that place, and, and it can change history. Look at Moses. I mean, if Moses was, I mean, Moses had every excuse in the world. God, I, I, I got to stutter. I, I, how can I tell your people, people to... To come out, you know, all the he had tons of reasons not to go and be simply obedient to what his God told him to do. But when he did it, history was changed. And now we have those scriptures as our admonition that we can look back and say, man, if God did it, then he could do it again. He can open waters. He can move mountains. He can, you know, we can shout grace to things that we thought were impossible. And God can do it. He wants to do it. He desires to do it. He's just looking for people that would trust him with all their heart. Can we be those people? <clears throat> now, I also wanted to go to, uh, I'm going to just jump into it. Let's go to Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. Because, you know, a lot of times, again, we get, we get caught up in the, the jumping and shouting and the exciting stuff that comes along with you know, uh, being in the presence of the people of God and being in God's presence and the Holy Spirit moving. And we should jump and shout because we have a reason to do so. We've been saved. That's reason to celebrate. That's reason to jump and shout. But when we are done jumping and shouting and we land, God's asking, how are we going to walk? You hear me? When you land, how are you going to walk? In Ephesians 5, 15 through 16 says this. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, redeeming the time, that's that's kind of a fancy word. I I like it because the name of my church is redeemed and I feel like I'm church banging on y'all if y'all go somewhere else. But but really, redeeming the time is literally buying back the time. Now, 
You got to be sleeping under a rock. And I ain't talking about the rock Jesus, so don't get it twisted. But you sleeping under a rock if you don't see just the sway of the wicked one on this on this world. I mean, and that, you know, to say on this world, that can sound vast sometimes. And it's like, man, the stuff that's going on in those other countries is crazy. And it is. But look what's going on in your country. Look what's going on, you know, in your community. Look what's going on in your house. Look what's going on with your children, you know. And the sway of the wicked one is so, he's, is so thick and he's so crafty. And there's so many things that are vying for our time which is precious, and the scripture tells us to redeem the time. Now, if you look back at all the choices that Adam and Eve had in the garden, right? There's, I mean, we don't know how many trees that there were that they could eat from. And God said, please, eat, enjoy yourselves, you know? Eat, burp, enjoy, right? That was, that was the eating that these dudes were given. Just enjoy yourself. But, but this one tree... Don't touch that. Don't don't touch that one. But look at all this that you got to choose from. Eat away. Just don't touch that one. And when the craftiness of the serpent came in again, that 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 sway of the wicked one came in and and convinced Eve that you ain't gonna surely die. You know if you take up this tree. You know God is God just don't want you to have that because He knows once you take a bite that you're gonna know the difference between good and evil. You're gonna live forever, right? And and Bishop said it. Like last week or the week before that, you know, the enemy, all he can try to do is twist you into forsaking that which you already have. We are already promised eternal life. We already have all that we need, but the enemy wants to twist you to think that it ain't enough. He wants to twist you to think that what God has given you ain't enough. I'm going to forsake that and I'm going to go here. When that's what God said, don't touch See, but we know the end of that story. We know that they ended up picking from the one that they weren't supposed to pick from, right? Now, fast forward, and it ain't nothing new under the sun, the preacher said, right? Time, everything has its time. Ain't nothing new under the sun. So now, flip it, right? And there's these thousands of trees that we ain't to touch. Okay, since you, since you didn't want all the trees, you know, when you had the chance and you wanted to eat for the one, I'm going to flip it for you, God says. Here, here's all these thousands like you did before in the garden. Don't, don't touch those. Eat of the one now, the tree of life, Jesus Christ, on this side of the cross. You hear what I'm saying? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? This side of the cross, there's thousands of trees out there that the enemy is telling you to eat from. But God is saying, no, don't touch those. Eat from the one tree, the tree of life, my son. Eat from that tree. And what do we find ourselves doing? Nibbling on all the mother trees that will still make it a devil. The de and I, and trust me, he's already been attacking me, so I ain't tripping. I'm, I'm girded up in the name of Jesus. I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. Understand, the devil's a worthy foe. But if you really think about it, like, dude's a buster. He's like, it's like, devil, you running out of ideas. You, you using the same ideas that you used way back then. Why? Because it, it's still working. It's still working. It's still the lust of the fret, the flesh, the pride of life, right? The lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's still the same old things that this flesh craves. This flesh craves. But we started off saying that the enemy is defeated. The enemy is defeated. The last enemy that we had, understand, was death. It was death. And when Jesus came and died on a cross, understood, understand that he did much, much more than we know. Jesus did much. When he came and he fulfilled what he did, he did much more than we even realized. Because when, when, when they thought he was dead, he was still working. He still took the keys of death from Satan and said, this is mine. This is mine now. I got the power to unlock. I got the power to give life now. And those who choose me, who choose life, are coming with me. You can't bind them no more in this. And if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is explaining this to these Corinthians and he's telling them, you know, you can you can boldly say since we have the victory, you can boldly say death. Where is your sting? Oh, grave. Where is your victory? It's been swallowed up in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus would have stayed dead and yet we would still be under that sway. But since he's alive, we're alive in him. Now, I heard it like this, too. If a wasp, if a big yellow jacket just Big dude right here just open the door and let a yellow jacket in and we can, it's just buzzing around. Everybody kind of going to be ducking and swaying, you know, girls going to be screaming. Dudes like me who think they El Macho still going to be like, 
Trying to play cool, but like, hey, it's a wasp, cuz, watch out. But the wasp was in here. Cuz we know the sting of that. I remember I got stung one time in my life by a wasp in the back of the head. I swore I got shot. I mean, them things, they're no joke. They sting real hard. But check it out. If that wasp, if that wasp represented death, yeah, and that stinger represented, you know, dying. Yeah, duck, because it's coming. But understand that if the, the stinger on that wasp was torn off and you, you witnessed it, you heard about it and you can see it, oh, the, it ain't even got no stinger. Would you still be ducking the same? Or would you just wait till you could just fire on it and just, ha, treat it like a fly and just crush it? Y'all are probably doing it in front of the ladies so they think you tough. Oh, I had a stinger. But, but understand that that's how... That's the picture of what it looks like, the way that Jesus disarmed the power of death. Death can no longer sting you. So you don't have to fear the death that is inevitable for those who are not under the blood of Jesus. That's why we can celebrate. That's why we can celebrate here. But but going back, see, there, there's all these trees that we keep nibbling from that God has told us to stay away from. But we continue to do it. And Ephesians tells us, to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, buying back this time because the days are evil. So when we come in here and we remind y'all things that Pastor Walt already tells you all the time and everything that your leaders and your pastors in here are telling you all the time to, to read your Bible daily, right? To constantly be praying, to be in the house of God on the first day, to give of the first of your tithes and offerings. When, when they're telling you these things, it's not just so they can like, a pocket check, homie, you give your offering today like it. That's not what it's about. What it's about is you getting a, a, a disciplined mindset, something that I've lacked constantly. A disciplined mindset to say, you know what? I'm going to do these things because I understand, wait a minute, dang, it's already Wednesday again. Dang, it's already Sunday. Time is just flying by. But if you ain't finding areas to buy back the time when the word of God, that's why, why you think when you get in the word of God at nighttime, it's like you've been hyped all day drinking energy drinks. As soon as you open up the word of God, you're like, <sighs> you sleep because <laughs> it's crazy how that happens. But understand that we got to find ways to buy back the time that the devil is trying to steal from you. You hear what I'm saying? Being in prayer, being in your word, being in scripture memory. Being with the brother and sister of the Lord who are walking with a common goal, who are obeying spiritual authority. These types of things are the only ways that we can literally buy up the time because it's precious. How many of you guys agree that time is precious? Yes. Like how, how long ago? I mean, it was like you was in high school the other day. You know what I mean? You flipped through your, your yearbook. Some of y'all had mohawks and now you bald headed. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a, it's a trip how that happens. Time is going by, and the time is going to pass whether you're doing what you're supposed to be doing or whether you're just goofing off. It's just a matter of how, what are you doing to redeem and buy back the time that you've been given. But it don't just tell us to buy the time. It tells us how to walk. It says to walk wisely. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools. Fools squander. Fools squander the time, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil and that Bishop told us this. It's like a picture of it. And for y'all, for those of y'all who this is reviewed, just bear with me because somebody's life is literally on the balance. I know it is. Somebody's life is on the balance. So understand when you are redeeming the time and you are walking wise, it's literally that balanced lifestyle of having like a balance beam and walking on like a tight rope. And it's, it's you know, gorillas and, you know, crazy biting animals on that side and piranhas on the other side. And you are just trying to walk this thing out by faith and balancing. That's, that's what it looks like. If you fall that way, you're doomed. If you fall that way, you're doomed. But this walk, this life, it's a narrow road. Right. And, and God is telling us how to do, how to walk wise. you got to have that balance beam, which is God's word. It brings balance to everything. Your opinion, you know where that's going to send you because it's going to send you the same place that mine send me. we got to be careful and walk wise as God has taught us to walk wise wise. Now, I, I brought up Moses earlier, and I was talking about how Moses, you know, how he was afraid to go with Pharaoh, but that simple obedience brought great change to a nation. And Moses, at the end of his life, he also penned something that was incredible. Once you have, see, any anybody that's that's lived this life, 
you know, for any amount of time that's significant, they'll tell you that hindsight is 2020, yeah. right? right? You know, if you've never, you know, did a 400 pound deadlift, you know what I mean? You will step up to that and you'll be like, that's scary, I can't do it. But somebody like my brother Gabriel, who, you know, does that in his sleep, he'll tell you, no, you can do it. You just got to work at it. Hindsight is 2020. You have to go through it sometimes in order to get the understanding of what it really means to accomplish that thing. And it's funny because, you know, somebody like Pastor Walt, who's been in this thing for a long time, they can tell you that, man, it started off where I just... You know, maybe I needed more courage and I prayed for courage, but now I got all the courage in the world, but I'm starting to run out of juice sometimes. So now I'm praying for endurance. That's that would be his testimony. Somebody who's younger in the faith to tell you, man, I'm just I know what I need to do. I'm just kind of afraid to do it. You know, they, they may lack courage, but I'm here to tell you that if you ask, seek and knock for the spirit of the living God, he's faithful to give it to you. You know, me being a, a evil father, according to God's word, right? If I if my daughter asks me for a, a piece of bread, I ain't going to give her no rock, right? If she asks me for a piece of fish to eat, I'm not going to give her a snake. So how much more does your heavenly father desire to give you the precious gift of the Holy Spirit? It's the only way that you're going to truly walk this thing out by faith. Otherwise, you're just going to get religious. You're just going to be, you know, trying to follow a, a set of rules that, you know, in the flesh, rules are made to be broken. It's just what it is. But if you have the spirit of God and you're trusting the men of God and you're in the word of God, you can make it. But Moses, at the end of his life, let's go to Psalm 90. Let's go to Psalm 90. And again, this is review for some of us, but again, I, I know that there's a reason that God brought this message because, you know, there's something about, I've, I've been taught like this, you know, there's something about the reality of the end of days or the reality of the end of your life that just suddenly shocks the church back into uh, position. You know what I'm saying? When you've been out there living frivolously and being stupid and just wilding out and like, you know, we just kissed, we didn't do too much, you know, and you just tampering with that, you know, and then somebody says, hey, um, we heard that Jesus was coming on this day. Even if you know, man, no, nobody know the day or the hour. There's something inside of you that's still like, man, maybe I should get in my Bible or maybe I should do something. You know what I mean? Like there's something about the, the thought of the end of days or the thought of your life being frail that brings you back to reality. And so that's what this that's what this is for. This is what Moses did in Psalm 90. Moses said, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. He said, even before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world. He said, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Amen. Your God is from everlasting to everlasting. There's no end. There's no beginning. Your God is God. He says, you turn man to destruction and say, return, O children of men. Check it out, because a thousand years in your sight is like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. Wow. And you look at all these, you know, older, older folk that was in the Bible. You look at the life of, of Seth, you know, you look at the life of uh, Adam. You even look at Methuselah. You know, these dudes was living... You know, 969 years, 912 years, 920 years. Like, these dudes was living. But they fell short of that thousand. They didn't live a millennium. But for your God, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is at a day. Time is nothing to him. We are bound by time. You hear what I'm saying? We're bound by time. Now, if you, I love this exercise right here. This is cold-blooded. Now, if you had a, if you had a box of matches, right, and this box of matches represented your life. And every day that you woke up in the morning, oh, breath funky, you had to strike a match. And at the end of the day, when you lay your head down, you had to put the match out and lay it down. How long before that box of matches is going to start feeling kind of light? You know, and you're looking at this pile, and this pile is getting kind of big of all the days that you lived. Are we living our lives in a way that's pleasing to God? Are we living our lives in a way that's redeeming and buying back precious time? Because you know, man, I mean, it's been a while since I did it, but the devil's going to catch what I just said and try to bring it back. But since I played video games, but dude, I used to get on the sticks and just, I mean, I'll blow four or five hours on video games and be like, dang, it's dinner time. Okay, I'm going to eat and finish this level. You know, there's so many things. 
There's so many trees. There's so many avenues because this world is under the sway of the wicked one. And he's doing all he can to get our minds off of what's really true, what's really precious. Jesus, the things of God. He wants us to focus on the things that are just bleeding and just passing. And like I said, that box of matches gets real light real quick. Trust me. And you know what? I can tell that some of y'all are like, you know, whatever. That was that was cool for Moses. So what I did, and this would this would get me shot in my church, but I'm gonna go to a book maybe that y'all believe, since y'all don't believe what the word of God is saying via Moses. So I went to your Arizona Republic. Oh. Okay. Now I got your attention, I see. But but let me let me catch up real quick. Or let me let me let me let me show you what God is saying and then I'll confirm it. He he used your newspaper to confirm. His way. He can use whatever he want. I mean, he used a donkey, you know what I'm saying, dealing with belong them. So he can use your newspaper, you know, if that makes you feel better. But look, I'm going to go back to, I'm going I'm to go to uh, verse 5 here. It says, you carry them away like a flood. This is back in Psalm 90, chapter 5. It says, they are like a sleep. He's still describing how frail life is, Moses, right now. He says, in the morning, our life, they're like grass which grows up. He says, in the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and withers. He says, for we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath. We are terrified. You have set our iniquity before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days had passed away in your wrath. He says, we finish our year like, like a sigh. We finish our years like a sigh. It's 2019. Dude, it's 2019. That don't trip you out. Like, you don't remember, like, waiting for the year 2000 and being like, I know something crazy is going to pop in the year 2000. It's 2019. What are we doing? What are we doing? He says, we finish our years like a sigh. He says, the days of our lives. Check this out. Moses is cold-blooded. He says, the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. So, take it back. I, 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 it's, I'm scared to read it. I ain't going to do it yet. But like I said, you look at Adam and you look at Methuselah and these dudes who were living 900 plus years. And that time is gone. And for God, that's nothing. They lived 900 and something years. Then, after God wiped out the entire world with his wrath via the flood and only you know Noah and the eight that were on the boat lived, right, to start life over again as we know it. Then he shortened the lifespan to 120 years. But Moses is cutting us down right here via what God is showing him. And he says the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they are 80 years. So uh, here we go. You're the paper you uh, maybe trust. So this is the obituary column, right? And it's, it's a gang of them. It's like 50 People that, that they know of that died today. 50 people. And I just grabbed 10 random ones. I got one, and I, I'm not going to say nobody's name lest it be one of y'all crusty grandma or somebody I don't want to ask you. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So, so I, got, I got somebody here that died at 95 years old. Somebody here that died at 96 years old. You're like, oh, see, he didn't know what he was talking about. Hold on. You got somebody that died at 28 years old. Somebody else at 96, you got somebody at 75, somebody at 79, somebody at 48 died today. You got somebody at 74, whoa, you got a dude that's 99 that died today. He was getting up there. And you got somebody that's 90 that died. Now, simple mathematics to find the average will allow me to do this. You take those 10 random ones that I grabbed, you add that all together, and then you divide that by 10, and that gives you the mean. Well, to get to average age, of the folks that died today from that random spot is 78. You probably can't see that. I got it written down. It's 78 years old. So God's word, God will not be mocked. He will not be mocked. He says 70, 80 in your strength. That average is 78 years old. Now, I'm going to bring it a little bit more close to home because I'm starting to get your attention now. But hold up. Hold up. This is cold-blooded right here. This is cold-blooded. So, 70 years. Now, stick with me. I'm going to do some math, but I'm going to do it really slow so you can catch on if you ain't a mathematician like I'm not. So, it says, 
70 years times 365 days equals 25,550 days. And you think about it, that's like, okay, that's maybe it's a lot of days to you, maybe it's not, depending on how old you are. 80 years is 365 days times um, 80 years, and that's 29,200 days, okay? Then I made it a little bit more personal for me. And I'm 36 years old. So what I did is I just took 70, subtracted 36 years that I've lived thus far, 34 years remaining. That 34 years times 365 is 12,410 days. Now, if you're 50 years old in this place, according to this, you got 7,300 days. 7,300 days. Now, that's a cold piece. <laughs> that's a cold piece. I mean, if you are living your life in a way, and I stand up here guilty as heck. I'm not up here pretending that I'm somebody that I'm not. Understand, like I told you, I was ordained as well a couple years, a couple weeks ago, and just the reality of that was so heavy for me, and I realized, you know, God just began to show me all the things in my heart, the jealousy as I looked at the, the various plaques of my brothers and sisters who were ordained, and I see you know, various titles. I see associate pastors. I see, you know, all these things that I desired to have. And it's like, minister, wait a minute. I did not put in more work than that. This is my wicked heart. This is my wicked heart that I'm telling you, man. It's real. We all go through it. I'm, I'm nobody special. I'm in need of a savior just like you are. You hear what I'm saying? You hear what I'm saying? Like, man, I, I look at all the time that I'm wasted. I look at all the, the, the resources that God has given me that I've wasted. Man, I, I, should have, I should have a home for my family by now. But I've, I, I just squandered and blew everything that God put in my possession. And so now I'm having to take it back a step and walk it out by faith. See, but a, a, a righteous man or woman may fall seven times, but they rise again. It's the wicked that fall by calamity. It's those who are continuing to eat from those trees that they know they ain't supposed to be nibbling from. Those are the ones that fall by calamity. But us who are baptized in the name of Jesus, us who are covered by the blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we have hope. We have hope. There's hope for us. Even though we've Squandered and wasted everything that God has sent our way. There's hope. Now, I'm going to end here. And prayer team, if y'all want to begin to prepare, you can. Worship team, if y'all want to come, you can. And I, you know, I, I feel, I, I get what Bishop talks about now when he says that that, that Holy Ghost hush, you know. Because like I said, there's something about the reality of time. Because, you know, the, the thing about it is, you know, when you look at, you know, Jesus when he gave that parable of the, uh, the cities, you know, and that parable of the talents. See, we have the ability to steward the, the talents in the cities that God has given us, whether we choose to do it correctly or not, we have the ability to steward those things. But when it comes to knowing when the master would return, that we don't have no control of. You, you hear what I'm saying? Like those, those ten virgins, five wise, five foolish, they had the ability to make sure that they had oil in their lamps. They all had the ability to go to the cities and, and purchase the oil and be ready. But they didn't have the the ability to know when the bridegroom would come. So all we can do, ladies and gentlemen, men and women, all we can do is be ready for our master because we, we don't know when that last trumpet is going to blow. And we don't even know when the trumpet in our own life is going to blow. So all we can do is be ready and trust God. But there's hope, like I said. There's hope. And Psalm 90, Psalm 91 I'm going to go to just to, to show us a glimpse of that hope. Psalm 90 now talks about those who dwell in the presence of the Lord and how they'll have the ability to trample scorpions underfoot and 
and how they have the ability to, to, to tread on lions. But in verse 14, it says this. It says, speaking of the love that our God has for us, and now him giving the ability to love him back, it says, because he has set his love upon me, he says, therefore I will deliver him. This is your God talking to you. He said, because you have set your love on me, therefore I will deliver him. He says, I will set him on high because he has known my name. Your God says that you shall call upon me and I will answer you. He says, this is his promise to you. He says, I will be with you in trouble. He says, I will deliver you and honor you. And this is, this is the hope that we have in Jesus. He says, and with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. With long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. That's the promise that we have in our God. So let tonight.